One of the perceptions that's used to develop a sense of dispassion is the perception of anicang, inconstancy. Sometimes it's translated as impermanence. But the word nicca doesn't mean permanent, it means constant. A nicca means not constant. And when you realize that, you, you see it all around you. Of course, we see impermanence around us. We know that everything is impermanent, even the mountain over there to the east. That's impermanent. But we feel it's solid enough. We wouldn't mind building a house on it. Just like we built a, a monastery on this mountain here. Even though we know that this mountain, too, is impermanent. But we figure it's a good gamble. The odds are in our favor. The effort that goes into building something that will be long-lasting is effort well spent. It's part of our calculation. But when you think about how inconstant things are, that changes the picture and changes your sense of what you're looking for. You're looking for some place to place your happiness. It's like sitting on a chair where one of the legs is not even with the rest. It wobbles. And so even though you can stay in the chair, it requires a certain amount of tension to make sure that it doesn't tip over. It's that sense of how precarious things are. That's what the Buddha is having you look at. And more than that, he has you fight against it first. We're trying to create a state of mind that is constant. You stay with one thing. And he's trying to have you shift your allegiance from looking for pleasures in sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, and ideas, to looking at the mind, the state of mind, the quality of the mind when it's still for your happiness, for your pleasure. It's one of the reasons why we have the Eight Precepts. They place limitations on pleasures of each sense. With sights, you have to say no more watching shows, with sounds, no more listening to music, smells, no perfumes, tastes, no food after noon before dawn, tactile sensations, no lying on luxurious beds. And that forces you to look into the mind, into the breath, to find your pleasure. But as soon as you do this, you are fighting against the perception of inconstancy. You're trying to make this constant, and you find that you can. It may not be totally under your control, but you realize, as long as you stay with the breath, and the breath is always there. You can just stay here for long periods of time if you want. And the Buddha actually wants you to shift your center of gravity here. So this is where you feel at home. It's only when you're well established here that he has you start looking into the inconstancy of even this state of concentration. You see that it, too, has its subtle ups and downs. It's that motivates you to try to get into deeper concentration. In fact, this is how you move from one state of one level of jhana to another, or to one of the formless attainments to a more refined one. Because you notice that the way you put the concentration together, after all, starts having some extraneous factors. In the beginning, you have to talk to yourself, evaluate the breath to make sure the breath feels good for the body, feels nourishing. All the different breath energies are working together. And it's just right for the mind. 
your breath is not laborious, but at the same time it's not so subtle you can't follow it. Or it does start getting subtle, you just expand your awareness. I think it's the sense of well-being spreading out through the body, too. And with that expanded awareness, you feel a lot more stable here. So the breath can even get to the point where it stops, which you're fine. There's a sense of a background energy in the body. You just stay with that. And you get more and more used to being here. But then you find there's still a little, little level of disturbance here, too. So you drop whatever perception is causing that, and you go deeper and deeper. So it's that disturbance, that little bit of inconstancy, that forces you to get the mind even more still, encourages you to get the mind more still. Because you're taking more and more seriously the Buddhist statement that there is no happiness other than peace. So wherever there's a disturbance, you want to get past it. You want to iron it out. Until you get the mind to the point where everything is as still as possible. But then you find that there, too, there's still a disturbance. There's still some inconstancy. Now, if you're looking for impermanence, you wouldn't see impermanence there. But you can see the inconstancy. It serves two functions. One, it alerts you that the mind is still doing something that's not quite constant, that's not quite steady. The level of ease or the level of stress in the mind goes up and down little bits. And you want to be able to catch what are you doing. And the other function it serves, of course, is it gives you a sense of dispassion, disenchantment with anything that's fabricated. Because, as the Buddha said, it's fabrication that is stressful. And yet it's how we approach our all of our experience. So you can't tell us right off the bat, you're just going to stop fabricating, because you can't do that. You stop fabricating on a blatant level, and you do it on a more subtle level. So the Buddha is having you do it precisely that. Get more and more subtle in their fabrication. Do you see that even the subtlest, calmest, most secure and stable fabrication even that has its little ups and downs. As the Buddha said, that's when you incline the mind to the deathless. So it's turned you around. Up to that point, the mind has been inclined to fabricate. And here, finally, the Buddha is getting you to see that it has its drawbacks. Now, the reason he does that is because it is possible to open up to the unfabricated. So he's not just bad-mouthing things for the sake of being critical. He's saying, what you're going for is a lesser pleasure. There's a greater pleasure. There's a greater happiness, a greater sense of well-being. But it's going to require that you get dispassionate towards the things that you ordinarily like. So simply understanding what he has to say is not going to get you there. There has to be a, a turnaround in the mind. As you begin to see that, yes, the more stability you can get inside, the better it is. And you keep following that until you get a full experience of what the unfabricated is like. The Buddha calls it seeing with a body. It's not just an intellectual understanding or intellectual ability to put things together. It's a direct awareness. You become aware of something. 
This is one of the reasons why it's called awakening. It's something that's been there all the time. You suddenly awaken to the fact that it's there. It's a full, full experience. The Buddha says you touch it with the body, you see it with the body even in one passage. In other words, you experience the right way, you experience your body right now. And it is a kind of type of seeing, but it's not seeing with your eyes. It's seeing with your full awareness. That's where he wants to get you. And so using the perception of anicchan, inconstancy, is one of his strategies to help get you on his side. Get the members in charge of your mental committee on his side. So you can taste something of what he tasted. You can see something of what he saw. So when anything threatens to get in the way of the practice, look for its inconstant side. It's going to show itself one way or another in the uncertainty, inconstancy, the ups and downs, the precarious nature of whatever that pleasure is or whatever that allure is. It's there to be seen. The more sensitive you are to the little changes that are constantly going on, the more the mind will be inclined to agree with the Buddha that this is a useful perception. There's that one passage he says that by whatever you conceive something, it's already become otherwise. In other words, the simple process of forming a concept in the mind based on something takes so much time, even though it's a flash of the eye. But in that flash of the eye, whatever it was that you based that concept on, that's changed. The change is that pervasive. So even though mountains are impermanent, but they're permanent enough for us to build houses on, you have to realize that the concentration we're working on here has its inconstancy, but we use that as a basis for our home for the mind. But we know that at some point it's going to start to deteriorate, so we've got to find something better, which is why the perception of inconstancy comes in. That's something you can see right before your eyes. It's not just a concept. It's a direct experience that will lead the mind to want something better. That's what that perception is for.